Part 3, Who Fired the Shot Heard Round the World, from the book King George, What Was His Problem? The Whole Hilarious Story of the American Revolution by Steve Schenken. Who fired the shot heard round the world? As their wagon rattled out of Lexington on the morning of April 19th, Samuel Adams and John Hancock could only guess at what was going on back in town. They heard William Diamond's drum beating, and they knew what that meant. A few minutes later, they heard a gunshot, then a huge burst of gunfire. A Glorious Morning When Samuel Adams heard the explosion of gunfire from Lexington, he had a pretty good idea of what had just happened. Oh, what a glorious morning it is, he said. John Hancock thought Adams was talking about the weather, which was not bad, but not glorious. Adams clarified, I mean, what a glorious morning for America. What was so glorious about it? Adams must have been thinking that those early morning shots would be the start of a long, hard fight for American independence. Hancock must have been thinking about lunch. He sent a messenger back to Lexington, instructing Dorothy and Aunt Lydia to meet him in Woburn, where Adams and Hancock were now headed. He told them to bring the fine salmon that they had planned to eat that day. Wait a minute. The American Revolution just started, and we're talking about salmon? What just happened back there on Lexington Common? gathering evidence. We're not exactly sure. British and American witnesses tell different versions of the story. You have to listen to some of the evidence and come to your own conclusions. Just after sunrise on April 19, 1775, Major John Pitcairn led the first group of British troops into Lexington. This guy was itching for a fight, as he had recently written, I am satisfied that one active campaign, a smart action, and burning two or three of their towns, will set everything to rights. Nothing now, I'm afraid, but this will ever convince these foolish bad people that England is in earnest. <clears throat> nice guy, huh? But Pink Cairn wasn't supposed to stop in Lexington on April 19th. He and his men were out in front of the other British soldiers because they were rushing on to Concord. Their mission? Get to Concord as quickly as possible and take control of the bridges in town. Remember, the British were already hours behind schedule, so Pitcairn was hoping to march right through Lexington. Then he saw the Lexington Minutemen lined up on the town of Common. There were about 70 of them, ranging in age from 16 to 65. There were eight father and son combinations. There were at least one African American. There was at least one African American, a 34-year-old man named Prince Estabrook. When John, when Captain John Parker saw the British approaching, he told his nervous Minutemen, let the troops pass by and don't molest them without they begin first. The Minutemen really weren't there to fight anyway. They mostly wanted to send the British a message. We're here. We have guns. We don't appreciate your visit. Pitt Cairn and his soldiers marched right up to the Minutemen. No one knew what was about to happen. The first shot. One interesting thing about this moment is that both commanders told their men not to fire. Pitcairn gave very clear orders to the British soldiers. I instantly called to the soldiers not to fire, but to surround and disarm them. John Parker gave similar orders to the Minutemen. I immediately ordered our troops to disperse and not to fire. So while the British tried to surround the Minutemen, the Minutemen started slowly walking off in different directions. It was a confusing scene. The key point was this. The Minutemen did not drop their guns. This angered the excitable Major Pitcairn, who started shouting, You villains! You rebels! You lay down! Lay down your arms! Why don't you lay down your arms? And now, in the middle of all this chaos, someone fired. Who? According to Minuteman Sylvanus Woods, there was not a gun fired by any of Captain Parker's company, within my knowledge. I was so situated that I must have known it. But British Lieutenant John Barker told a different story. On our coming near them, they fired one or two shots. So no one takes credit for the shot heard round the world, the first shot of the American Revolution. It might have been a Minuteman, or it might have been a British soldier. It might even have come from one of the houses in town. What we do know is that when the British soldiers heard the shot, they lost control. They started charging, screaming, and firing their guns. Our men, without any orders, rushed in upon them, fired, 
and put them to fight, said Lieutenant Barker. The men were so wild they could hear no orders. Some of the Minutemen stood and fired back. Others ran for their lives, blasting away as they retreated through town. Three cheers. The shooting on Lexington Common lasted about ten minutes. It finally ended when Colonel Francis Smith, he's in charge of this mission, remember, rode into town. Smith found a British drummer and ordered him to beat the ceasefire signal. This worked. Eight Minutemen had been killed and nine more were wounded, including Prince Estabrook, who was shot in the shoulder. The wounded men crawled to nearby houses for help. Only one British soldier had been shot and slightly hurt. It took Smith about half an hour to get the 700 British boys calmed down and organized. He spent a little time yelling at the men for losing control. He warned them to follow orders next time. Then he let them give three cheers for their victory, and they marched on to Concord. Salmon Update Dorothy Quincy and Aunt Lydia watched the whole thing from the window of the Clark's house. When the shooting started, Lydia leaned out the window to get a closer look. A bullet whistled past her head and crashed into the barn next door. She pulled her head in. After the British left town, the two women set off in a carriage to meet up with Hancock and Adams. Yes, they remembered to bring Hancock's fine salmon. The salmon was cooked at a house in Woolburn, and everyone was sitting down to lunch when a man ran in and started shouting that the British were on their way. So the fish was left behind, and Adams and Hancock rode farther from the fighting. Later that day, they ate some cold pork and potatoes. Now the action shifted down the road to Concord, where the Concord Minutemen were ready and waiting. How did they know the British were coming? This morning, between one and two o'clock, we were alarmed by the ringing of the bell, explained Reverend William Emerson of Concord. Who brought you the warning, Reverend? The intelligence was brought to us first by Dr. Samuel Prescott, Emerson said. Prescott was the one who had escaped from the British patrol the night before. He raced into Concord and started spreading the news. By seven in the morning, about 250 Concord Minutemen were gathered in town. They weren't sure what to do, though. They talked it over. They decided to march out to meet the British. A Concord Minuteman named Amos Barrett remembered parading out of town with the group, a few of the men proudly playing their drums and fifes, small flutes. Then, out on the narrow road, they saw the 700 British soldiers coming toward them. They stopped. They realized they hadn't really thought this plan through very well. They turned around and marched back into Concord, with the British right behind them. Both armies had their drummers and fifers going strong. We had grand music, said Amos Barrett. Barrett and the Minutemen marched up into the hills above the town and waited to see what the British were going to do. The Americans had time on their side. The alarm had been spreading from town to town all morning, and more Minutemen were pouring in from the towns around Concord. Soon there were 300 Minutemen in the hills, then 350, then 400. There were also lots of people from town, mostly kids who were up there to watch. It was getting crowded. The Minutemen had to ask the spectators to go somewhere else. Josiah Haynes was the oldest man to fight that day. This 79-year-old Minuteman had gotten up at dawn, grabbed his musket, and marched eight miles to Concord. Now he was glaring down at the North Bridge and at the British soldiers guarding the bridge. He told the captain of his town's militia, if you don't go and drive them British from that bridge, I shall call you a coward. Hold on there, Josiah. Everyone was still hoping this day would end without more bloodshed. Breakfast time. Down in town, British soldiers started looking for weapons. That was the whole idea of this mission, as Gage's secret order to Colonel Smith explained. You will seize and destroy all the artillery, ammunition, provisions, tents, small arms, and all military stores whatsoever, but you will take care that the soldiers do not plunder the inhabitants or hurt private properties. Unfortunately for Gage, the people of Concord had been expecting something like this for days. By now, nearly all the military supplies were hidden in attics or buried in fields. At the Wood family home, for example, a pile of guns had been hastily shoved into a bedroom. When the British came to search this house, the Wood women welcomed the soldiers. They told the men they could search anywhere they wished except for one small bedroom where a sick woman was sleeping. The British officers considered themselves gentlemen, and they would never disturb a sick woman, so they ordered their men to leave that room alone. Needless to say, 
no weapons were found in the wood house. Meanwhile, Colonel Smith and some of the other British officers set up chairs on people's lawns and started ordering breakfast. These guys were used to being served. Women in Concord grumbled and gave a few lectures on the rights of Americans, but they were willing to make a little money. They sold the officers meals of meat, potatoes, and milk. All the while, the soldiers kept up their search for supplies. They found a few barrels of flour and some musket balls. They tossed it all into a pond. A few days later, the people fished everything out. Most of the flour was still good. They found a few cannons and they destroyed them. They smashed up the wooden carriages that were used to haul the cannons around. Then they set the broken wood on fire. That fire changed a lot of lives. Just ask Hannah Davis. The Bridge Fight Early that morning, Hannah Davis had watched the action Acton Minutemen gather outside her house. Acton was a town near Concord. Her husband, Isaac, was their captain. She later said, My husband said but little that morning. As he led the company from the house, he turned himself round and seemed to have something to communicate. He only said, Take good care of the children, and was soon out of sight. Now, up in the hills, Isaac Davis and the other Minutemen saw smoke rising from the middle of Concord. They were too far away to see that the smoke was just from the burning cannon car carriages. Will you let them burn the town down? shouted one Minuteman. No, no, the other men roared. Captain Davis led the Minutemen down toward the North Bridge. We were all ordered to load, said Amos Barrett, and had strict orders not to fire till they fired first then to fire as fast as we could. At the North Bridge, a British officer named Walter Lorry looked up and saw 400 angry Americans marching toward him. Lorry didn't have much time to form a plan. A few British soldiers ran onto the bridge and started trying to rip up the wooden planks. The Americans called out for the British to stop messing with their bridge. Then the shooting started. As usual, no one knows who fired first. We soon drove them from the bridge, reported Amos Barrett. Several Minutemen and British soldiers were killed or wounded. Isaac Davis was one of the men who died at the North Bridge. This bridge fight is remembered as a major moment in American history. That's because up to this point, neither the Minutemen nor the British soldiers had really expected the day's tense events to explode into an all-out battle. Now men on both sides had been killed. Now it was going to be a long, bloody day. A long, bloody day that would lead to seven years of war. The nightmare begins, and the British were not prepared for a long, bloody day. They haven't even, even bothered to bring an army surgeon with them. Colonel Smith stood in the middle of Concord, wondering what to do. Every time he lifted his telescope to the hills around town, he saw more Minutemen up there. He really had no choice. He had to make a run for Boston. It was a little afternoon when the British army marched out of Concord. No drums and fifes this time. The march was quick and quiet for about 10 minutes. Were the Minutemen hiding in the woods along the road? The British had no idea. They found out when they hit a bend in the road called Miriam's Corner, home of Abigail and Nathan Miriam. Hundreds of Minutemen opened fire from behind trees and stone walls. Bullets zoomed at the British from all sides. The British soldiers started running, hoping to get past the Minutemen, but the bullets kept coming. They kept coming for the next six hours. We were totally surrounded with such an incessant fire as it's impossible to conceive, said Lieutenant Barker. The Minutemen had no organized plan, but there were a lot of them, about 3,600 men from more than Forty different towns showed up before the end. The day ended. They were able to line the road all the way to Boston. Men would shoot, duck back into the woods, reload their muskets, run forward, and shoot again. Minuteman and Reverend Edmund Foster explained the strategy like this. Each saw his own place and opportunity to attack and annoy the enemy from behind trees, rocks, fences, and buildings. The British soldiers must have felt like they had wandered into a nightmare. We all first kept our order and returned their fire as hot as we received it, said a soldier named Henry D. Bernier. But 
they were still 15 miles from Boston, and soon they started running out of ammunition. The men panicked. We began to run rather than retreat in order, Dave Bernier said. Wounded men who could still walk held on to horses for support and hobbled along as fast as they could. Badly wounded and dead soldiers were left lying in the road. Battling Brothers It was dark when the fighting finally ended. More than 250 British soldiers had been shot, and 73 of them died. About 100 Americans had been hit, half of them killed. 79-year-old Josiah Hayes was killed while reloading his musket. That evening, John Adams stood on a hill in Boston watching the surviving British soldiers stumble back into town. It's hard for us to imagine what a shocking scene this must have been. Keep in mind that even patriots like Adams still considered themselves citizens of the British Empire. When I reflect and consider, wrote Adams, that the fight was between those whose parents but a few generations ago were brothers, I shudder at the thought, and there's no knowing where our calamities will end. What's next? You won't be surprised to learn that British and American soldiers told very different versions of the amazing events of April 19, 1775. According to General Thomas Gage, British soldiers had marched out to Concord on a simple, peaceful errand. Then, for no reason, they were viciously attacked by sneaky rebels. A number of armed persons, he reported, to the amount of many thousands, assembled on the 19th of April last, and from behind walls and lurking holes, attacked a detachment of King's troops. According to the Americans, a pack of bloodthirsty British soldiers had invaded the quiet towns of Lexington and Concord. Then, for no reason, the soldiers started shooting people. Express riders raced from town to town with letters saying, The barbarous murderers committed on our innocent brethren on Wednesday the 19th have made it absolutely necessary that we immediately raise an army to defend our wives and children from the butchering hands of an inhumane soldiery. Militiamen all over New England responded to the call by grabbing their guns and marching toward Boston. By the end of April, nearly 20,000 of them had gathered. They had the British army trapped in Boston. They had no idea what to do next. King George knew what to do next. He was outraged that colonists had dared to fight with British soldiers, and he was more convinced than ever that the British military would soon bring the Americans to their knees. He said, When once these rebels have felt a smart blow, they will submit. Okay, George, we'll test your theory next.